tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the Breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoners free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad. Communion Chapel of San Antonio, Texas. I'm really glad you decided to be with us again. We're glad to see you. 
We are continuing our series, Missional Living. Principles. Principles from the history of the early church about living effectively in the power of the Holy Spirit for Jesus. Principles. Timeless truths. Things that are not going to change. We're going to take a moment to pray and then we're going to get started. God, I pray that you would use this time for your own glory and for our good. I'm praying that you would be lifted up and that you would enable me. I'm not worthy. I'm not able to do this on my own. I am a broken and extremely flawed vessel. My prayer is that you would be pleased to speak through me, to encourage, to educate, to edify. I'm praying that you would help us to receive what is being said. My God, I'm praying that our time would not be wasted, that my preaching would not be in vain, but that you would make it count. In Jesus' name, amen. When we think about what it means to be a witness, sometimes we can be a little overwhelmed, intimidated. How would I do that? How would I explain my faith? How would I present the truth concerning Jesus Christ? I can never do that. But the truth is, you can. And the preparing to be a witness is so simple, you would almost miss it. When we look at the method of Jesus to prepare people to be a witness, it's not real complicated. I just want to show you a little passage. Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Then he appointed 12 that they might, and it's just three words, be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Eventually they would go out to preach. But at first... They really just needed to be with him. You're saying, I see what you're implying. It can't be that simple. It really is. If we would just make a decision to be with Jesus, there is going to be a consequence to the sequence. Every sequence has a consequence. The consequence of spending time with Jesus, the consequence of keeping company with Christ is always the same. People who consistently keep company with Christ are radically changed for the better. That means you. In his fellowship, they receive his uncanny manners, his determination to win, his commitment to the Father's will. They receive his love for the loss. And such people eventually become change agents in heaven's charge against the gates of hell. You're thinking, how could I ever become a witness? It really is as simple as this. Be with him. If you would be with him, eventually you are going to be like him. Let's look at our passage today. We are in Acts. We're continuing in our series in Acts. We're not going to take a long time. We're going to make this quick. We're going to expedite it. It says in Acts, verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. This is Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. Previously in Acts, we saw that Peter and John are teaching in the temple. They're teaching resurrection of all things. And why are they teaching in the temple? Because a huge crowd came together because they healed this guy. This guy was over 40 years old. And he was born lame. He was lame from his mother's womb. And now he is walking and he is leaping and he is praising God. And people are filled with wonder and amazement. And they're wondering, what is going on? How did this happen? And Peter, because he is missional in his thinking, he realizes, I'm a witness. I'm not here to draw attention to myself. I'm here to draw attention to Jesus he makes sure that everyone understands it wasn't our power. It wasn't our piety that caused this to happen. He says what actually happened was the power, the name, the person, the program of Jesus has had an effect on this man and that's why he's healed. That's how he explained it. And while they're preaching and people are hearing the word, while they're talking about the resurrection of Jesus, 
the enemies of Jesus. And they thought that they had gotten rid of Jesus. The enemies of Jesus, those that thought that they had silenced him, they came upon them, arrested them, and put them in custody. And then they put them on trial. That was in the previous lesson. They put them on trial, and when they put them on trial, I guess they thought they were going to intimidate them, but that's not how it worked out. Because Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins to judge the judges. He begins to indict those who thought that they were going to examine him. And then we're in verse 13. And they saw this boldness of Peter and John. And they perceived, they observed something. They realized something when they observed this boldness in Peter and John. What was it that they perceived? They perceived that they were un educated. You know, I'm listening to these guys and they are, um, they are not accustomed to being on trial and knowing the things that you would normally say. They don't have the preamble. They don't have the introduction. They, they are totally uneducated in these court matters and in the handling of legal things and they're untrained uneducated, untrained. I mean, the, the Galilean accent just about gave it away. And it says they marvel. They're like, wow, these guys, these guys right here, they're not educated. They're untrained. In fact, the word that is used to describe them in Greek is idiotas. Do I have to tell you what that means? I said, man, these guys are idiots. And they marvel and they realized, here's what they realized, that they had three words, been with Jesus. If you don't remember anything else that I say today, if, if you don't come away with anything else from this message, but you come away with this, then you have come away with everything. That if you would be with Jesus there is going to be a consequence to you keeping company with Jesus and eventually it results in you having his character, his uncanny ability to face off with his enemies, to keep his cool and to present an irrefutable response to those who would come against the truth of the gospel. How are you going to do it? Real simple. Be with him. Spend time with him. That's what they did and they realized the enemies, the, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin group, they realize they who, Peter and John, they realize that, man, these guys, they're idiots. They're not educated. They're not trained. Yeah, but they have been with Jesus. I've seen this before. They had seen it in Jesus. What did they see in Jesus? Jesus exhibited learning beyond explanation. When he was a child and he was in the temple, he exhibited an understanding that could not be explained. They marveled at the questions that he was answering when he was 12 years old. John chapter 7 verse 15, it says, And the Jews marveled. How does this man know letters, having ne never studied? He has not been in our better schools. He has not been in our best synagogues. And yet, he definitely understands these scriptures, he can rightly divide the word of truth. And it's because he himself often withdrew and prayed. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, spent time with the Father. And if you spend time with him, Jesus will teach you. They, they remembered that Jesus easily defeated his enemies in arguments. He didn't have a problem getting into an argument. He was never outmatched because the people he was arguing with had more degrees than a thermometer. In Matthew 22, 15 through 22, Jesus used a scripture to defeat the logic of the Pharisees and the Herodians when they tried to trick him and say, hey, Jesus, should we pay taxes? It was a trap. Matthew 22, 23 through 33, Jesus uses only the Pentateuch to prove the idea of the resurrection, that there is a spirit, that there isn't an afterlife, and he defeats the false doctrine of the Sadducees. Sadducees don't even accept all of the Old Testament, and they regarded the idea of the resurrection as a Pharisaic innovation. And Jesus is saying, okay, you only use five books, I'll use your five books, and, and using only 
the Pentateuch, he is able to defeat them. Matthew 22, 41 through 46, Jesus proves that his enemies have a model of Messiah that is too limited and that it cannot be reconciled with Scripture. He proves y'all are actually not at a place where you can ask me questions because you don't, you're not able to answer some of the more basic questions. Jesus did that. Jesus used miracles to prove his message. In Matthew 9, 1 through 8, he raises a paralytic man and he proves his ability to forgive sins on earth. In John chapter 8, 56 through 9, 11, he heals a man born blind and proves his claim to deity. In John chapter 11, 1 through 44, he raises Lazarus and he proves his claim to be the resurrection. And now here's what's happening. That rabble rousing rabbi he was removed, but the men that he mentored are doing the same thing. You know, Jesus is wanting to mentor you. Don't be intimidated. Don't be scared to present the gospel. Don't be, don't be afraid to get out there and declare the truth concerning Jesus. You don't have anything to worry about. Because just like these men, they were able to stand and present the truth. They were just like Jesus. They could present an irrefutable and irresistible argument. And Jesus is still, the resurrected Jesus is still doing that. He's still doing that. The consequence of keeping company with Christ has caused these disciples to have his character. You know what? They look like their leader. That's what we see. And they realize they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And that's what Jesus said would happen. Jesus said that there's coming a time when they are going to arrest you. They're going to take you in custody. But what it is, it's actually an occasion. It's an opportunity for testimony. Therefore, Luke chapter 21, 14 and 15, settle it in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And that's what had happened. And they could say nothing against it. Right? They couldn't argue with it. And that is what they had seen in Jesus. And now they're seeing it in the people that Jesus has discipled. And that's what they're going to see in you as you keep company with Christ. Verse 15, 17. 15 through 17. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. The same guys Y'all step outside for a second. We, we, we don't talk for a minute. Y'all go out of here. Saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. That's evident. It's evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But, so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on, they speak to no man in this name. And they couldn't even bring themselves to say the name of Jesus. They just referred to it as this name. And so when they are away, they admit they're unable to refute what they're saying. They admit that the miracle itself cannot be denied. And they admit, you know, all we have now, all we have, this is all we have, we can threaten them. I, I guess that's what we're going to have to do. You know, I have to wonder that when they came up with that plan, hey, uh, let's threaten these guys I have to wonder if anyone said, look, man, they've been with Jesus. They teach like him, perform miracles like him, respond with irrefutable logic like him when they're cross-examined. Guys, threatening Jesus didn't work, and it ain't going to work on his disciples. They're going to look us in the eye and tell us that they're going to keep doing what they're doing. I have to wonder, did anybody say that? I have to wonder. Well, they said, this is the plan. We're sticking with it. I mean, we can't deny the miracle. We can't deny... What has happened? This, this guy is whole. He's walking. Everybody knew him. Four, guy's over 40 years old. And so they said, hey, let's bring it back in. So, verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Mm. Mm. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. 
So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So they call him back in and their plan has been to threaten them and say, you're not going to teach anymore in this name. And Peter and John answered them with two things. They answered them with sarcasm and their mission statement. Like, no, they didn't use sarcasm. You think human beings invented sarcasm? You don't think that God can be sarcastic? You don't think the Holy Spirit can be sarcastic? I'm reminded of times when I am at a party and you hear someone talking with a medical or a legal professional or a software professional and, and you hear the, the epiphany, hey, you know, you're, you're a legal guy. Hey, you know, you're a doctor. Um, I, I've got this, this problem here in, in my, in, you know, I'm just wondering if you have anything to say about it. And I listen to what Peter, he says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, more than to God, you judge. Here's what he's saying. In effect, listen, to it. it's, it's sarcastic. He says, hey, you know what? Y'all are judges. I mean, this is the Sanhedrin, right? That's what y'all do. Y'all judge. Y'all judge people. Y'all like judging. How fortuitous. I have something that, I mean, if y'all mind, take a moment, judge this. Is it right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God? Come on now. Do your thing. Judge. You need to hear he's being sarcastic. Y'all are a formal gathering of people who judge things. You try to ascertain whether the person speaking is telling the truth. You try to get to the heart of the matter. He says, I got something. Get to the heart of this. So I listen to God or listen to you. Judge that. And then he brings out his mission statement. The mission statement of the apostles. The mission statement of he and, and John. The mission statement of everybody who receives Jesus. They made it clear. What? That they speak what they have seen and heard. That's what he said. He says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We can't do otherwise. What are they saying? They're saying, look, what we're doing is what we have to do because we are witnesses. That's our mission. That is what we're called to do. That is who we are. They become missional in their thinking. They become courageous because they've been keeping company with Christ. And what happens? Well, here's what happens. So when they had further threatened them, they're still trying that. They let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. It was the end of the conversation. And what started out as a judgment of the men turned into a judgment of the judges. When it was all said and done, there was no way of punishing the preachers because of the people. Can you see the stark contrast? They are afraid of the people, but Peter and John, they only fear God. If you only fear God, then you can do the right thing no matter what the situation is because you don't practice situational ethics. People who live in the fear of people, people who are people pleasers, their ethics change in every situation. What's right over here is not right over here. But when you fear God, because God does not change, when you live in the light of the calling that is on your life from God, right? You can be consistent. And they were. All of this is the outworking of the fact that they had been with him. I want to encourage you today to be with Jesus. How can you be with Jesus? It starts by receiving him as your savior. Jesus died for our sins. What are sins? Sins are those active and passive ways of rebelling against the right of God to reign in our lives. Sin is any time we fall short, any time 
We move away from what God would have us to do, to do what we would do instead. Is that really bad? It's very bad. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In fact, it really doesn't matter what sins you have committed. There is only one sin that would cause you to be forever condemned. And that's the sin of unbelief, of not taking the treasure of your trust and putting it in Jesus. You can do that today. You can take the treasure of your trust and put it in Jesus. You don't have to walk an aisle. You do not need to pray a certain prayer in order to receive Jesus. I don't see anywhere in Scripture that anyone prays a certain prayer to receive Jesus. Not a bad idea. It might help you remember the moment, but we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. If you make a decision to receive Jesus, to believe in Him, God raised Him from the dead to prove that he not only did what he said he was going to do, which was to die for our sins, but that he is the Christ, that he had told the truth. And if you would put your faith in that Jesus, all your sins are forgiven. All your sins are blotted out. If you would put your faith in that Jesus, then you too can have forgiveness and you can have the favor of God upon you. and You have a future and a hope to look forward to. That's the first way in which we can be with him. And then we can be with him daily. We can be with him in prayer as we study his word. We can be with him in the fellowship of his people. We can be with him. I want to encourage you with that. I want to thank you for joining us today. God bless. Take my heart, I lay it down at the feet of you whose frown. Take my life, I'm letting go. I lift it up to you whose Bow.
bow down before you, only you, Lord. I will worship you, Lord, only you, Lord. I will bow down before you, only you. Ah. 